So let's uh, let's stay like this. So hi everyone uh, and welcome to lecture number three, microfluidics. And uh, we already had the first two lectures uh, the, about uh, introduction to biomems. We went uh, uh, kind of uh, into a smaller, uh, into a more focused area, which was lab on a chip devices. We learned about the different uh, parts of a lab on a chip. And now we will go down into the third lecture, which is another uh, important aspect of microfluidity of a lab on a chip. And later on, from lecture four, we start to uh, dive in to the actual molecular reaction that happen at the transducer surface to understand better how to design a uh, Lebanon chip. Now, before we begin, I want to say a couple of uh, words about the, uh, the evaluation process. So at the end of the course, um, I talked with Wewe and we decided that uh, uh, everyone will need to submit uh, a two pages, one or two pa uh, two pages uh, report uh, focusing on a lab on a chip that you want to invent or to you want to develop. You, it is allowed to have one only one figure of drawing how it's it, how the lab on a chip gonna be uh, gonna be like a scheme. And the idea is that this course is not a, there is no textbook for Lebanon chip. I built this course for my experience over the years. And therefore, uh, when you write the report on the Lebanon chip that you want to build, you can use uh, the, the essence that you learn from each lecture. From, for example, in lecture two, uh, you can uh, uh, use the, the parts uh, of the uh, Lebanon chip, so describe where the input, the sample goes to the input, what are the pretreatment uh, steps, how they are uh, transferred, the sample is transferred to the sensor, and so forth. So that's the main goal of the report. And if you have any questions specifically, I will be more than welcome to answer at the end of the class also at the end of every class. Okay. So here we're gonna study today what happens to fluid at the micro scale, micro scale because it's a bit different uh, of a fluid that happens in the macro scale. What are the main properties of fluid in a micro scale or we call it the microfluidics? So we're, just, we're gonna understand the basic parameters in fluids. Uh, we're gonna understand different process equations that define uh, flow in microfluidics. Then we're gonna analyze uh, some examples for microfluidic application in a lab on a chip devices. So the first question to all of you why do we need to use microfluidics? What is the purpose of the microfluidics in the lab on a chip uh, uh, device? What do you think? And everyone can write down in the, in the chat, whatever you think. Why should we use microfluidics in a lab on a chip? What do you think? Anyone? Why should we use fluid or microfluidics in a laboratory? What is the purpose of using these microfluidics, these channels? And we thought something about it uh, in the previous uh, lecture. So smaller amount of analyte required, so smaller volume, indeed smaller analyte of, uh, of uh, of the analyte, use less energy, that's correct, low cost, better sensitivity, that's 
could affect, but more the sensitivity is related to the sensor. So that was very good answers. Uh, so the first saving is the sample saving. So it's a smaller amount of analyte. For example, if you want to measure presence of uh, enzymes, we need nanoliters, not milliliters. It's very costly, so the smaller volume, the better. Uh, the more, the less cost, less expensive is the assay. Faster analysis. Uh, we can heat or cool small volume very quickly. So we can control better. We don't have to wait for a beaker to start heating and won't get like a um, homogeneous heating or cooling. Integration. We can use the microfluidics to connect between different parts of the lab on a chip. So we can integrate multiple functions on the lab on a chip. In the micro scale, we also have novel, novel physics. Uh, we see how diffusion is affected in the micro scale, surface tension and surface uh, effects become more dominant. And in the end, we can actually reach to much faster uh, reactions. So here, uh, there's an example why should we use microfluidics. So if we look uh, on the right hand side, the smaller the volume, we actually get higher, uh, much higher concentration. For example, one molecule in one microliter is 1.6 10 to the minus 18 molar. But if we go into uh, smaller, uh, volumes such as picoliter, so one molecule in a picoliter becomes 1.6 10 to the minus 12 molar. So eventually, the concentration of the molecules becomes much higher, which eventually will also affect the signal that we measure. Uh, any questions about this slide? Okay. Another advantage is the surface to volume ratio. So it's the ratio between the surface area of, uh, the, of the solution, of the actual solution itself, over the volume itself of the solution. So in a macro scale system, when we have one meter um, uh, side of, uh, of a cubic macro, macro system, we get about the ratio about six, six, uh, one over meter. But when we go into much uh, microsystem, cubic microsystem uh, 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 example, you see that the ratio increases by 100,000. So basically the surface area to volume ratio becomes much higher, much uh, bigger. So that's why the, now the barrier of the flow, if you have the flow itself, which is the green uh, uh, cube, whenever the surface that it touches, such as the channels uh, wall, they have a huge impact on the flow behavior. Any questions on this slide? Okay. So what is the definition of a fluid? The definition according to textbook is a substance that deforms continuously under shear stress. So it can be either both gases or liquids. It's also called fluid. It can be classified as either Newtonian or non-Newtonian uh, characteristics. And here we're gonna focus more on a fluid that behaves like a Newtonian uh, behavior, which is shows the linear relationship between the shear stress applied to the fluid and the velocity pro profile perpendicular to the wall of the channel. 
So the T, the tau uh, um, shear stress itself equals to the fluid viscosity. It's the fluid friction or resistance to the applied shear stress. This is the viscosity, eta. And the derivative between the fluid velocity towards direction of the y direction, which is direction towards the wall. So the shear stress is the 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 um, the velocity, the change of the velocity towards the wall times d fluid viscosity equals to the t, t, to the tau shear uh, shear stress. Shear stress is the effect of how much the wall will deform the fluid. Any questions on this slide? Okay. Again, if you have any questions, please write in the chat. Otherwise, uh, it's very important to understand each, each step in the slides. Now let's look, uh, let's learn about what are the important parameters in fluids. So we have the density of liquid, I guess everyone learned uh, in basic chemistry, uh, which is defi the density defined as the uh, rho equals to the ratio between the mass of the liquid and the volume itself. Okay, this is very straightforward. Then we have the pressure. The pressure that the that uh, the fluid is being affected is the force applied over the area which the force is distributed. And here you can see the, the pressure. It equals. Uh, it uh, can be uh, in a units of uh, kilogram per meter per uh, cubic square um, or Pascal. PA. So it's the ratio between the force and the surface area that the force applied or distributed. And now we want to combine both the density of the liquid and the pressure that is being applied. So, and we apply and we define the flow resistance, which is mainly determined by the viscosity of the fluid. And the, the uh, viscosity is defined by the pressure over uh, the change of the uh, of the um, velocity towards the uh, towards the wall of the of the channel. So this is another definition of the viscosity. Or we can also defy, define kinematic viscosity, which is the viscosity over the density of the liquid. So the flow resistance, which is the, uh, the shear stress interacted between the channel wall and the flow itself, is affecting the, fl the force itself, the force, and it's mainly uh, uh, determined by the viscosity uh, itself. Any questions about this slide? Okay, let's continue. Now we now we define another pro, another parameter, or it's called Reynolds number. Now Reynolds Reynolds number, by the equation is the ratio between the inertial forces to the viscous forces, which means here we have the rho, which is the density. Sorry, yeah, uh, d is the typical length scale. Maybe it's kind of short, sorry. 
a typical length scale in the system. So it's usually the diameter of the chamber, the ten channel. V is the average velocity of the moving fluid. And Ni, which looks a bit similar to V, but this is Ni, is the kinematic viscosity. So it actually shows the ratio between the inertial forces, this is the forces uh, um, that are governed by the flow of the fluid, and the viscous forces which are governed by the viscosity of the solution. And now we see a range for Reynolds number. And the reason we calculate this Reynolds number is because that when it's going towards lower numbers, such as one, okay, it means that the viscous forces are much higher than the inertial forces. So basically, the fluid all the time is being forced to slow down, okay? to flow very, very slowly. And then we're gonna start to see laminar flow. It's a flow without turbulence. On the other hand, when we increase, when the number of Reynolds number increases to around 4,000, means that we have very high uh, inertial forces over the viscous forces. Therefore, we have a turbulent flow. So this is usually the first step when you calculate uh, your system in order to know if what kind of uh, flow you expected to have in your channels. Calculate the Reynolds number, which tells you if it's a very low number, probably it's gonna be laminar flow. Any questions about this slide? Okay. So now let's see how we can start to describe how the fluid flow or the dynamics of the fluid through the channel. So we want to see how the fluid uh, behaves in each different point uh, in a location in the channel and also over time. So usually we describe the fluid with a very basic uh, principle uh, we describe the dynamics as a simple incompressible uh, fluid, which means we use uh, Newton's second law, which is the motion equation. Now, in this class, I mean, I won't go into the actual details of mechanical uh, engineering or mechanical fluids. Uh, I will go to and show how you can use the derived equations to describe the flow in your micro channels. So the most commonly used force density, uh, which is uh, basically uh, the uh, force over the volume, are coming from the pressure. So the force of pressure pushing the, fl the fluid and the force of the viscosity of the fluid itself. So there are two forces that affect the um, flow in the microchannel, which eventually, I will not show the, the, uh, the how it was derived, the equation itself, it's, it's in the uh, text, in the books that I uh, gave in the literature. There is a very famous equation called Navier-Stokes equation for incompressible fluids. It describes the dynamics of the fluid. If we have the uh, uh, the density the density itself, rho, which changes the um, the velocity of the solution with the change of the pressure in the system and here is the effect of the viscosity. So it actually describes the velocity of the solution in any point in any time in your microchannel. 
Any question? Any questions on this slide? Okay. Let's continue. Now let's try to see what we can do with the Navier-Stokes equation in a microfluidic system, and we're gonna solve it with the specific conditions. So the first, and we're gonna see with this condition how the flow will behave in the microfluidics. So first we describe, we define no slip boundaries, which means that the velocity at the interface between the wall and the liquid is zero. So basically there's no sliding, so this fluid doesn't slide over the wall, it just, it's zero, it, the velocity is zero there. It is one condition. Also we're gonna consider a steady and fully developed pressure driven flow uh, and which uh, with a new Newtonian fluid, and we can refer it as we also known as Purcell uh, flow or Hagen Purcell solution. This is the solution that we're going to show now in a non slip boundary, considering these properties of the flow. Again, this is very simple, uh, basic uh, solution. And after we solve the Stokes, the Vier Stokes uh, uh, equation with these boundary conditions, we get the velocity of the solution towards the radial direction. Radial direction is towards the, from the middle, okay? It's uh, through the channel width. And we see that it's based on the change in the pressure we have eta, which is the viscosity, L is the channel length, R, B, uh, um, R is the channel radius, and R, small, uh, uh, lowercase r is the location on the channel. So let's see how that it looks like. In the center, Again, remember R equal zero. So what we get is a specific yeah, R equals zero. So we get this kind of uh, flow, which is the fastest flow of the solution in the channel. Again, this is the change of the pressure uh, from the beginning to the end of the channel. These are the walls at zero and at H. And now we start to describe the velocity of the solution from the middle of the channel towards the wall. So in the middle, it's r, uh, a lowercase r equals zero. So we can derive the fastest velocity, which is described by the vector. And the more we go towards the wall, the lowercase r increases till h over two, which eventually will lead to zero. When the wall R equal uh, uh, uppercase R. So what you can see that it's based on a parabolic uh, uh, equation or description of the flow in the channel. Fastest flow in the middle, the flow equals zero at the wall. Uh, any questions on uh, this uh, on this slide or this equation? Okay. So again, it was a very it's a, it's a way that you you can take the navier stokes equation and solve it here. What is example in a very simple uh, dimensions? It's very simple uh, uh, constraints. And you, of course, can take the Navier stock and solve it in different configurations and see what you're gonna get. So here's some uh, examples. Uh, we're going to find another parameter, Q, the volumetric flow rate, which is the ratio, or the, it's the 
mean velocity times the cross sectional area. So how fast the solution flows through a specific cross sectional area. And for a circular microfluidic channel, this is the one that we solved in the earlier slide, Q equals this parameter, this, uh, this variable, this equation. And then we can describe the hydraulic resistance of the solution as uppercase R height, HYD, S8 times the viscosity eta, L is the length of the channel, pi, and uh, R uh, exponent 4. So this is the resistance of the solution in a circular microfluidic channel. So we can also uh, solve the Navier-Stock equation in a rectangular microfluidic channel, and this is uh, a bit different. So you can there are different uh, principle, different uh, solutions for different uh, uh, geometries. Any questions on this slide on the volumetric flow rate slide? Okay. So we saw how the fluid behaves or how we can describe the fluid in the microfluidics with the Navier-Stokes equations. Now let's see what happens to the mass transfer. It's not the flow. It's not the solution itself. It's the analyte or the molecules that we have in the microfluidics. Let's see what happens to them. So first, there are three types of mass transfer. There is the advection, which is a transport of molecules uh, uh, carried by the uh, fl flow of the fluid. And usually it's called convection, which is the combination of all flow towards all directions of the advection. While TC, is the time, it's basically the length over the uh, velocity, which means the time it takes to a particle to drift through the system, through the convection. This is the velocity of the water that carries the, uh, the particle. Then we have migration. It's direct mass transport in response to electrical field. So basically, when we, we have a charge molecules, we apply electrical field, and the charge molecule is being migrating due to the electrical field force. And we have diffusion, the last uh, type of a mass transfer, which is due to, due to a, stoch a stochastic process where the molecules drift from one region when you have a lot of molecules into another region which will have a lower concentration of the molecules. And X calls the, rad, ran, the, uh, the random walk is the, 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 the uh, direction or the length that the molecule, the particle uh, uh, passed due to diffusion is and it's uh, defined by the einstein uh, smolkovsky relation, and it depends on the square root of the diffusion coefficient and the time. So remember that, that the distance that the, that the particle transfer uh, uh, passes in diffusion is related to the square root of the time. Then we combine, and here we, uh, we here we're going, to, well, we're going to address only to diffusion and advection. We can get the convection diffusion equation. So it's fixed law together with convection, and C is the concentration 
of the particles v is the um, velocity of the solution d is the uh, uh, diffusion coefficient and this is derivative over time so basically if we take uh, this equation so we can derive the time scale which takes for the uh, for the particle going under diffusion s x is basically l the distance uh, uh, squares uh, distance over 2 d so just taking this equation and changing it to get the time itself that it takes for a particle to pass through the specific distance with the diffusion to the diffusion mechanism Okay, so this is a very important slide. Do you have any questions on this slide? Any questions? Okay, so I'm going to have a question for you to see if you're listening to me. So if you have a distance uh, that a particle needs to pass, which is L, lowercase L, would a particle will pass faster through diffusion DL or through convection? What do you think? And if you don't know why, why, why not on on what is dependent? So we have the particle need to pass the distance of L. One particle passes that through diffusion, and one particle passes that through convection. Which one gonna pass first, or will pass it in a in a shorter time? The particle with the diffusion or the particle with the convection? What do you think? How do we know which one passes first? Or do we actually can do we actually know which one will pass first? We have a distance of L. I want to see some answers. Distance of L. One particle passes this distance through diffusion. So this is as the time of the diffusion. And the other particle passes this distance with convection, which is this is the time of convection. Which one passes first? Can we know that? What do you think? Can we know which one will pass, which will pass, which way of the particle will pass first the, this kind of distance? The diffusion, question mark, okay. That's good, you can try this. More, more answers. And I will call you 45 because this is the only number that I recognize. And also write why do you think diffusion is the, the faster one? More answers. What do you think? Diffusion or convection? Come on, come on. I want to see answers. I know it's late in the evening. What is 7.40? Uh, But it's the end of the week also. So come on. 45, why do you think it's a uh, diffusion? So let's try to see what, if you can describe it. So I'm gonna write here. 
So we have, for example, TC. What? It's bigger. How do I change it? Okay. TC over TD. So if TC is bigger, let's see what happens. So TC is L over V and TD, well, it's L square over 2D. Sorry for the very bad writing. So we have this one and we get Well, well, 2D. Over V times L. So what it tells us, if this number is higher than one, who is f who gonna who is gonna be faster, the convection or the diffusion? What do you think? If this number, it's two times d over v times l. So TC, if this nine. If this number is higher than 1, it means the TC will be higher. So therefore, the diffusion will be faster, right? With a smaller T. So it all depends on the diffusion coefficient, the velocity of the water, and the length. And if this number is higher than 1, it means that the, one, that the diffusion particle wins the contents. And if it's the other way around, smaller than one, then the convection one wins. Any questions about this slide and this kind of contest between the convection and the diffusion? Okay, you see how it was? We get this number higher than one, it means that this number, TC, is higher than TD, which means that it's gonna take longer for the convection than the diffusion. Okay. Let's continue. Now we're going to find another number that describes the flow in the solution, such as Reynolds described the uh, turbulence or laminar flow in the channel. And now we describe the Peclet number. Peclet is a constant and it defines the ratio between the advective and the diffusive transport. You see, it's kind of similar to what we said. So we have the advective transport and the diffusion transport and the ratio between is the L times V over D. It's very similar to what we did. So whenever Peclet number is much smaller, it's very small, means that this number is much smaller than this. So the diffusion have a transport much have much more impact on the flow or the mass transfer than the advection. Therefore, the advection can be neglected. On the other way around, when the number is very, very high, about 1,000, it means that this number, this part, is much bigger than the, uh, the, the lower part, which means that 
the advective part has much more effect than the diffusion, therefore we can neglect, neglect the diffusion. So it's another way for you to calculate by knowing the length, uh, the velocity, and diffusion coefficient to know in this kind of constraint dimensions flow rate, would you have a more advective or diffusive transport? Do you have any questions about this slide? Okay. Thank you. So this is a, so let's take a couple of minutes and think about this question. So everyone, assume that a distance that a particle needs to travel is 100 micrometer. And the velocity of the fluid is one centimeter uh, per second. Which means that the advection time that you get is 10 milliseconds. What we're going to have, okay, this is not the one that I want to calculate, but Let's go over this one, that it means that now let's try to calculate it for different types of analytes. And we get that for small ions, we have a diffusion cof constant, which is much faster, because they are much smaller, the time of the diffusion is going to take its five seconds. Therefore, the ratio between the time for the advection or the convection and the time for the diffusion becomes 500, meaning the diffusion cannot be neglected. Now we go into a bit bigger uh, particle, the uh, about 30 base pairs of DNA, the diffusion constant become 4 to 10 to the minus 11. The time of the diffusion now for this distance of 100 micrometer is 250 seconds. It's a lot. Which means that the Peclet number is 25,000. Which means if the particle takes the to take the to do the diffusion for 20, 250 seconds and the and for the advection effect it has 10 milliseconds so we can start to neglect remember it's much higher than 1000 can start to neglect the effect of diffusion and for much bigger particles and a cell or even larger molecules which are about 20 micrometer in diameter we can see the Peclet number becomes very high, which means that we can neglect the diffusion and the main part that we need, the main part of the flow that we need to take into account of the mass transfer is the advection effect. So we have a question, so that's another uh, parameter that you take, need to take into account when you try to model and start to understand from these equations how would the mass transfer behave in your uh, system. You can calculate the Peclet number and also estimate the time it's gonna take for your molecules to uh, to transfer in your system. So if you take a large molecules and you are in your directions are based on diffusion and not advection, you're gonna take wait a long, 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 long time. And therefore you should apply advection effects or convection in your system to transfer the cells. Uh, any questions about this slide? And the effect of the particle size on Peclet number. If 
confusion versus eviction. Okay, so let's continue. So after we learned about the properties of fluid and how we can describe flow and mass transfer in the system, let's go now and see an example of how we can we utilize this understanding to invent new types of uh, microfluidic structures that have different functionalities. The first, so the example that we have here, it's called an H filter. It means that it's a, it's a way to separate particles of different dimensions without a membrane. So usually you have particles from different dimensions and you flow them through a, fi well, through a, fi through a filter. And the filter has different, different pores with different sizes and it filters the uh, smaller particles from the bigger particles. Here, with the H filter, you can separate the particles, but without a membrane, and we're going to see how we can do that. This is the H filter, and of course, you, you probably can understand where the name came from, from the, uh, from the structure that shows, looks like the letter H. And the system works like that. We have from one inlet, we have two channels, the blue and the red. And in between the channels, there is nothing. They are connected to each other. Solution can flow from one to the second one and vice versa. There is no membrane there. So from the inlet of the lower, um, lower channel, which is the red, fluid, we have two different types of particles. Let's call it the bigger particles, which are the white ones, and the smaller particles, which are the gray ones. On the upper channel, you have just a solution, just the buffer, or just the liquid itself. And in the end, you want to separate that in the outlet of the red area, you will get only the bigger particles, and in the, out, in the outlet of the uh, blue channel, you will get only the smaller particles. So what happens that the mechanism to, to separate the particles is based on the diffusion over the advection effect. So it means that Whenever they have interaction or you see the, the flow, the two different uh, channels becomes, uh, have the interaction of the, uh, the fluid, the fluid becomes uh, interacting with both channels. Both molecules will basically diffuse to the upper channel because there's no particles there. But the gray particles, which are smaller, they will diffuse faster than with the smaller, uh, with the bigger particles. Now it's eventually all the particles will, will transfer to the top channel, but it's everything depends on the velocity, the U0 of the lower channel and the upper channel. So we want them, we want the gray particles, the smaller particles to diffuse to the higher channel but on the same time, we want that, that the advection of the flow will be fast enough not to allow for the bigger particles to flow into upper channel. This is indeed very awesome, very cool. Of course, it, it, it's not 100% and you optimize the velocity, which eventually most of the smaller particles will go to the upper channel uh, and very few of them will go to the lower channel. Now, we can calculate the time that it will take for the convection to work over the time 
of the smaller particle to pass uh, W over 2, which is half of the channel. And then we, can, we, ca we come to a threshold. A threshold that defines the diffusion coefficient have to be um, W, a square W over U0 uh, times U0 over 4L, which means that the particle to diffuse to only half of the way has to have a much smaller diffusion coefficient and the other particle that you do want to pass uh, the half of the channel have to have higher diffusion coefficient. Okay, so again, D is the threshold that a particle, that this is the number that we want to, if you want to separate two particles, we need to have one particle higher than D, that's gonna diffuse much faster, therefore will this uh, will transfer to the upper channel and another particle smaller than D that will not be able to pass all the channel, uh, all W over two or half of the channel. So any questions about this kind of example on this slide? Okay, let's continue. So, if we look on particles and we know the diffusion coefficient, we can look at different conditions that will govern the separation of the particles. For example, here we have the T-convection and the T of diffusion. And we saw earlier how we can calculate the time for taking the particle to pass. It was uh, here or here, yeah. Yeah, here, sorry. T convection and T diffusion. So T convection and T diffusion. And then you can calculate the peclet number. So let's see what happens. For diffusion, we want the T convection will be much smaller than T diffusion because we want mechanism to affect it that will affect the diffusion. Therefore, we need low peclet number and we will calculate it by the, this number. For no, for no diffusion uh, effects, we want to have the T convection much bigger than the T diffusion. So therefore, we're gonna have a high peclet and if you're going to have high peclet, meaning that we need to wait, so it means that you have we have more advection effect than or more convection effect than the diffusion. So the time it will take for the particle to pass is very, very, very slow. So therefore, we either need longer channels, right, to allow enough time for the particle to pass or we need to flow that much faster, sorry, uh, we need to flow the much slower, yeah, to enable enough time for the gray particles to diffuse more than W over two. So whenever you come into a channel, you can use this kind of calculations and see that in your dimensions or your uh, geometry, which one, which of the mechanism it becomes, uh, of the mass transfer becomes more, uh, more dominant? Is it the convection or the diffusion? So do you have any questions on this slide?
Okay. So here I get about a paper that I want to show you another example. It's kind of the discussion. And I'm going to explain the paper. I mean, later on you can go to this paper and uh, download it, but I will explain what happens here. It's a paper uh, which wanted using a microfluidic flow uh, to fraction circulating tumor cells Remember, I told you that it's the, it's the tumor cells that uh, detach from the tumor, start to circulate in the blood, and eventually bind to another organ, and they're called metastasis and become a new tumor. So they wanted to take a blood sample, to lyse the red blood cells, and now take all the cells that without the red blood cells, so we have the white blood cells and the CTCs, put them in the micro, in the micro, uh, in the lab on a chip microfluidic device and separate the circulated tumor cells from the white blood cells. So let's see how they did it, and not with an H filter, but with something else. So I described the purpose. The process time was about 17 minutes. That it, the input, the inlet, was the solution, the sample, the cells, and the output, the, the separation of the CTCs from the white blood cells. So first, we look what are the components, what are the parts of the lab on the chip. So we have the inlets. And they are going here through this kind of uh, uh, channels, basically to separate between them into a homogeneous solution. The green one is are the white blood cells, and the red one are the circulating cells, circulating tumor cells. So we have the inlet, we have the uh, mixing, we have this part which is the separation between the CTC and the white blood cells. And eventually you have reservoirs that the white blood cells go into here, or the outer to waste. And here you get the CTCs, so you kind of accumulate them and you start to understand how they, uh, to start to uh, characterize what kind of tumor cells are, which type, which eventually can tell you what kind of treatment you can have is the best one for the treatment. So again, you get a mixture of CTCs and white blood cells. You go into a series of chambers, we're gonna understand exactly how it happens, which eventually the white blood cell goes into the small chambers and the red blood cell continue and go into the bigger channel and to the outlet. So any questions about the components of the lab on a chip? Okay, so let's continue. So how the biological cells are separated? So usually in my class, I usually ask uh, and let people to read the paper before, but we didn't have time for that. So I'm gonna ask, so the mechanism for the separation is based on the diffusion rate of the CTCs over the white blood cells. So the white blood cells, they, have, they, are, much, they are much smaller than the CTCs. Therefore, they have a much slower diffusion rate. So whenever we flow them in here, you can see in this channel chamber, we flow the solution. Here they go with the same velocity. Now, as you remember, I said earlier that the uh, the profile of the flow in a micro channel becomes parabolic. So you have faster ones in the middle, a faster velocity in the middle, and slower one in the sides. So what happens when the mixture comes here, the 
smaller cells with the blood, white blood cell can diffuse faster to the site where they have a much slower flow while the bigger one becomes goes in the media which are the CTCs and eventually you, get, you, you will get a separation and you can see it here much better that the white blood cells which diffuse from the middle to the side and slow and flow much slower they will become they will be present on the side of the channel and the CTCs which is much bigger and they don't have enough time to diffuse to the sides and they flow much faster they will be in the middle therefore the white blood cells goes to the chamber from the sides and the CTCs they don't have enough time to go to the side so they keep on flowing in the middle and do it a couple of times to get a more better separation which eventually accumulate the CTCs in the last in the in this in, in in the chamber where you have the slowest uh, we have the uh, more bigger particles so let me go let's repeat it again you have a mixture of CTCs and white bats since this is much bigger so the diffusion of them will be much slower and we know that the profile when we have in microfluidic when we have the chambers the profile it's it's like a parabolic flow the profile is of the velocity of the solution meaning in the middle we're going to have much faster velocity of the fluid and on the side you're going to have much slower velocity so whenever the cells come here the white blood cells they diffuse faster to the side and they start to flow much slower and the CTCs, they don't have enough time to flow to the side, so they keep on flowing very fast in the middle, which eventually, which eventually you get a separation of the white blood cells on the side, close to the chain, close to the wall, and the CTCs are in the middle. So the white blood cells, they keep, keep on flowing on the, in, on the wall, keep, uh, close to the wall, and goes to these reservoirs, and the CTCs doesn't have time to flow to the sides, so they continue in the middle, and being accumulated in the outlet, um, in the outlet uh, chamber. So, any questions about the mechanism of separation? Another way to separate between two different molecules, particles, different dimensions, uh, by using the configuration of the flow configuration of profile of the channel. So now they can accumulate the CTCs and, can they, and what they want to see is how good was the separation. So here they took two different types of uh, cancer cell CTCs and what we can see in A they had the inlet is the concentration of the cells, the CTCs and in the outlet they got much uh, bigger co much higher concentration of the CTC so basically it focused them it concentrated them because I don't know if you said it I said this but one of the major challenges with CTCs are to they are present in a very low concentration so sometimes it can take a lot of time to accumulate them and to get an, enough cells to study them so you get and the outlet much higher concentration and in the waste you don't get anything the waste is here because there are no white blood cells same for another type of a cancer cell also the inlet specific concentration and in the outlet much higher concentration with some cells that went to the waste now in C let's see the separation yield what they did is that the um, Let's see. Okay, so they in the inlet they look they put the white blood cells, and they want to see of how much what will be the recovery or how much cells you're gonna get in the blue is the outlet of the CTCs 
and red is the output of the white blood cells. So they put white blood cells. So obviously they will get a lot of white blood cells in the outlet of the white blood cells here. And none, almost no cells in the CTCs. And this is the same thing just for the CTCs and different types, different types of breast cancer, circulating tumor cells. And they get a lot of cells in the CTC outlet and almost none in the white blood cell outlet. So the separation works. Works very good, actually. Any questions about this slide? Okay. So now they want to say, okay, we, we get the cells. Let's see what we got in the, um, in the outlet of the CTCs. And now they use fluorescent microscopy and using different types of labeling where uh, DAPI, uh, uh, yeah. DAPI uh, uh, dyes all the cells, CTCs and white blood cells. EPCAM, it dyes the cells, the cancer cells, which are uh, in a in green while cd45 it's a dye that that uh, that uh, that labels cells white blood cells so let's see what happens in a here we have metastatic uh, breast cancer patient cells they took from patient took the cells from the blood and flow it through the solution and what they saw that they do recognize first they recognize many cells like one two, three four five six seven three of them were cancer cells one of them was white blood cells and another three unrecognized then they flow and I control they they circulated the uh, uh, or flow CTCs, only CTCs, not the blood from the patient, only CTCs. And what they saw, they recognized one cell. The need was was positive. Mind you, EPCAM labels cancer cells, and indeed it was positive for the cancer cells. So the separation of the CTC or eventually the CTC arrived. To the right outlet and they took eventually also another types this is uh, so here they kind of show the example that uh, they took another CTC but this time it was a type that doesn't have the EPCAM, so the label, it cannot be labeled uh, with green fluorescence. So even though they extracted it in the CTC outlet, they saw only the blue color and not the green one, which recognized specific type of CTCs. Any questions about this uh, experiment? Again, this is experiment to validate the separation, they measure, they characterize the cells that they got in the CTC. Whenever they introduce blood sample from a patient, so they saw CTCs and white blood cell. This is a sample, and it's all BNCR controls. This is a, a, a sample when they flow only CTCs, so they get a, a which can be dyed by EPCAM. And here the flow CTC, which are not dyed by the EPCAM, but eventually all the cells arrive to the outlet of the CTC. I heard any questions here? Okay. 
Now I want to ask you, so take a couple of minutes and think about what could be the problems of this lab on a ship. What do you think? What could be the problems for this kind of lab on a ship? This is a time that think hard about this kind of lab on a chip. If the purpose was to do separation of CTCs and white blood cells from a patient, what do you think could be any problems with that? Can it apply the right, uh, can it be used for the right functions or it wouldn't be more very effective where, what are the problems that you have in the CTC? And the goal in this kind of exercise to develop more cognitive uh, 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 learning skills to be more critic, critical thinking about these devices. So what do you think? Anything. Why? I mean, it's a very cool idea where it could work. What could be the problem or challenges for that? Purity. I guess you mean that, uh, that in some times you get, although you want to separate the CTCs, you get some white blood cells. That's correct. That's what you mean. That's correct. It's not 100%. Um, eventually, you will not have fluorescent microscope to quantify the cells. You eventually you will uh, you will accumulate the cells and you just gonna just gonna uh, um, count them so it doesn't mean that you will know which one is one and you will address all the cells as ctcs and you're right we saw that some of them were even other type of cells so purity is really indeed a big good challenge a very uh, big challenge very good more, I want to see more critical thinking, come on. What could be the problem? What could be the problem with this kind of lab on a chip? Remind me, remind me again, you want to have label free isolation so we don't die the cells. Uh, we want, we don't want to, uh, and we want to separate the CTCs directly from breast cancer patients. What could be the problem? I want to see answers. Kadim, come on. It's in Hebrew, Kadima. What do you think? You can discuss among yourself also, if you're sitting next to someone else. It's a very good way to do the thinking. What do you think? What could be a challenge here for this device to achieve the goal? And this is a very important exercise. And I'm gonna repeat that in the next lecture also. I want you to think critically about problems. Any more? I can think of at least another two problems. Is this device being controlled by temperature or by oxygen? We don't see any control system on that, any control uh, environment. So any change in temperature or in uh, any environmental effects will affect the, the separation um, quality of the device. So we have the challenge of the controlling the environmental uh, parameters. What else? What else? Come on, I want to see some thinking. I know it's late. I know it's... 8.20 in the evening. You're all very young. So 
You're not very tired. Another challenge. Because in your report, by the way, when you invent this kind of, uh, describe the, uh, the lab on a chip, you should also have a couple of sentences about describing the challenges. Or what could be the problems with this kind of lab on a chip. This is the critical thinking that I want to develop in this course. So another challenge is that CTCs are present in a very low concentration in the blood. So it's gonna take, so if we no, want to catch them, we need to flow a large volume of blood. So eventually in this microfluidics, you need to, we need to flow a large volume of blood to get the enough number or, uh, or enough number of enough, enough CTCs in the outlet to be recognized, to be accumulated. Okay, so I don't see any more problems that people write. So uh, I hope you're gonna do best, better next time. I want to see critical thinking. So with that, we fi finish the lecture number three, microfluidics. We wanted to understand the basic parameters of fluid. Uh, we wanted to understand equations, uh, how to model or describe the flow and the mass transfer, you remember Reynolds number, Peclet number, uh, what are the dominant uh, mechanism, transport mechanisms in, the, uh, in your configuration, geometry. And then we saw some two examples about the H filter and the separation, uh, the CTC separation application. So let's do some summary. And this is for everyone to think. So there's some protein called PEA. It's a, it's a biomarker, it's an analyte uh, that if we have the PEA protein, it means that there is some pathogenic cell that causes uh, disease. Now, in your, someone comes to you and tell you, I developed a day lab on a chip that it takes one hour for me to detect one protein of this biomarker in a 100 micron long channel. And tells you one hour is too long. How can I improve the Lebonacci performance, the response time? What do you think? What do you will tell him or her? How to improve the response time for one hour into shorter times? What do you think? Again, the question is, you have a channel, Lebanon chip, person comes to you and says, it takes me one hour to detect one of these proteins and my channel is 100 micron um, one well, micron long channel. How can I improve the response time? What do you think? I want to see answers or ideas. What can you change in the channel to decrease the time? change the environment for shorter time, such as temperature. So how you will change the temperature? Will you increase or decrease the temperature? What do you think? This is actually, by the way, this is, this is, this is the correct direction. So do you, are you going to increase or decrease the temperature to get much faster time? You, what do you think?
Okay, the medium thing about increasing or decreasing the temperature, I see another answer, Dilu dilution. Full diffusion, what does it mean, full diffusion? So the one says dilution and full diffusion, please explain yourself in more detail. So increase temperature, that's correct, because if we increase the temperature, the, uh, the rate of the, f of the mass transfer is much faster. That's very good uh, answer. What about dilution or full diffusion? I would like to, uh, if you can explain more, because there are other ways also to decrease the time. What do you think? Okay, so another option could be um, to decrease the, the height of the channel. So you have a, low, small, a shorter time, to uh, shorter lengths to pass, therefore the time will be shorter. Or we can add convection and not thrusting or diffusion to uh, to transfer the molecule through the 100 micron height channel. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, so with that, we finish lecture number three. And uh, next week, we're going to have uh, another series of uh, lectures. And this time, we're going to go down into miniaturization effects at the sensor interface to understand what happens there and how we can model the interactions between the analyte and the sensor itself. Um, I wish everyone uh, nice, a very nice weekend, uh, Tatian, Tatian, and uh, I'm here for another couple of minutes if anyone wants to ask any questions. So thank you everyone and Tatian. Hi. Okay, I will send it again. I will send it through the uh, to the WeChat, right? I can do that. Okay, but only if everyone promise. If everyone promise not to look ahead, because sometimes they ask questions that the answer is in the next slide. So uh, absolutely, we're gonna send the slides for these past uh, le three lectures and I'm gonna send the next one also. Okay? No, tomorrow? You said, Okay, so tomorrow, uh, uh, maybe I uh, missed the, the, the date that you sent me. Okay, so see you tomorrow. Okay. Okay, fantastic. So see you tomorrow, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>